Uh, hi, I'm Dr. Arlen Myers. I'm the president and CEO of the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs, and welcome to another uh, episode of our SOAP Colorado chapter meeting. We're doing this one virtually, obviously. And today we're going to talk about uh, issues and answers concerning uh, real estate, uh, particularly for physician practices and startups. And we're going to go through a whole bunch of questions and answers and have a conversation with my guest, uh, Amanda Harden. Uh, welcome, Amanda, and thanks again for joining us. Yeah, this is an awesome group. Thanks for having me, Arlen. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so, um, as I said, uh, what we're going to try to get out of this is what do you need to know about real estate post-COVID, either as an investor or maybe as a physician or a physician practice, and where do you go, where do you work? If you're in a startup or you're starting a company, there's a lot of changes with co-working and hybrid and all these terms that have happened. So little by little, we're sort of inching out of this and there's all kinds of issues. So I thought it would be fun to, uh, to talk about some of these. So let's start off with uh, Amanda, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and let folks uh, know a little bit about you. Sure, uh, as Arlen said, my name is Amanda Harden. I am an RN by schooling. I practice as a, as a nurse briefly and about 15 years ago, I was quite unsatisfied with my career, much like many healthcare practitioners, looking for something different. And I found myself in the world of commercial real estate and I have not looked back since. I do keep my RN active. I stay very connected with the medical community. I love being a translator between the medical community and the commercial real estate world. Um, if you've ever leased or purchased commercial space, you know it's not an easy task. And I really get a lot of satisfaction um, putting healthcare providers and ancillary healthcare services into good commercial real estate deals. Good. <clears throat> so we have a cozy group. Um, and let me just a couple of uh, uh, tips. If you have a question, I just pose it in the chat. And we'll answer it when you when you ask it. I'd rather answer your question than just go through a bunch of stuff and not answer your question. So yeah, why don't please. you go ahead and yeah, and then I'll if you put up your question in the chat, uh, then I'll call on you and ask you to unmute and you can just answer introduce yourself and ask your question. So that said, um, uh, so obviously uh, the first question everybody asks in one of these is what has been the impact on co of COVID uh, on your industry. <laughs> we'll need longer than we have today. Um, yeah, in it, three minutes or less. Right. right? I, uh, COVID really changed everything. Uh, I know everybody hears, oh, real estate's really hot right now. Residential real estate really boomed in 2020. And if you think about why, it makes total sense because we all got forced to stay at home. So everyone was suddenly like, I need a bigger house. I need more space. I need to go here. I got laid off. I can move. For commercial real estate, we saw our office buildings go dark. We saw healthcare practices got shut down. Y'all could not do elective procedures. So we really got turned upside down. It forced us to rethink how we use space. Obviously, everybody's heard there's a housing crisis. We need more, more residential units. We suddenly have these empty office buildings. Uh, the state of Colorado actually has just put together a task force to start examining our zoning ordinances around the state and seeing if perhaps we could allow conversion of empty office buildings into residential. So it really, a lot of conversations we've been kind, kind of having got forced with COVID to, to look at properties. Obviously everybody knows industrial's hot. We have this Amazon, it's, we still call it a phenomenon even though it's been around for a while. And that has really increased the, the demand for industrial space. So really no part of commercial real estate got untouched. Uh, medical real estate completely got changed with COVID for a lot of reasons, um, coupled with the fact that there is a lot of physician dissatisfaction and a, a lot of physicians are trying to move away from traditional medical campuses to off campuses. So everything is changing. Um, it's, and a, a, you know, a lot of it has to do with COVID and then a lot of it has to do with our technology. Uh, we can we can get together easier. You don't necessarily need the huge hospital conglomerate right. to handle the healthcare. It's it's awesome. And every day, every day you read about another industry that's kind of going hybrid or refigure yep. it out, work from yep. home, blah blah blah. Yep. Um, good. So um, 
for those of us that are not uh, deep in the woods in, uh, in uh, commercial real estate, um, I think most of us at some point have had something to do with buying or selling a house, sure. which is residential real estate. Um, so how is residential real estate different from commercial real estate? What, what do viewers need to know? They're completely different. Um, I think the only things we have in common is the word real estate at the end. So um, I am a commercial broker. I've only ever been a commercial broker for the last 15 years. And things that are important to a commercial broker are things like zoning ordinances. Um, you know, if you're going to develop something, how tall can you go? What are the uses? If you're going to buy a property, can you actually do what you want to do in that property? When you buy a house, you just know you can live in that house. There's no question about it. Just because a, a building is a commercial building doesn't mean that what you want to do in that building is actually allowed. Um, we obviously, there's leasing, there's purchasing, you can invest, you can put together groups of investors. Everything is different. The way commercial property is taxed is extremely different. And that creates a, a much larger financial burden and something that needs to be considered. Um, it's the two completely different worlds. Yeah. Commercial is basically- You brought up a point. So what, what in fact makes commercial commercial? Because we've, you know, in Denver, at least in Colorado, we're seeing these uh, zoning changes where how many people can live in a house. Sure. So what, what makes a commercial a commercial? Like if you have a house, but you're actually doing business out of it, sure. is, is that a commercial, technically commercial or no? It's your zoning that defines what your property is. So, because you've got residential zoning and you've got commercial zoning. Within residential, you have multiple different areas of density. So you have single family residential. You may have a zoning that allows for a duplex. You may have something that allows for four units and up to, you know, you've got these two, three, 400 unit apartment complexes. So it's your zoning. So it's residential and you can have X number of units. And then you've got commercial zonings that breaks down into, into retail, office, industrial, and then your industrial will even break down into light industrial, heavy industrial. And that, that just uh, dictates what activities can take place. So it is, are you R residential or are you a C zoning? Keep it simple. Yeah, good. So yeah, so some what, houses um, have commercial zoning. Yeah, what, um, what are sort of the headlines as far as what's up with medical real estate? And by that, I mean physician or group practice offices. And then the same, the same question for, I guess, for startups or, you know, if you're a digital health company and maybe you started out with three people at a WeWork and now you're kind of grown into something and you're looking for actually an office. So what are the trends? Yeah. Well, so this is where working with a competent broker is really to your advantage, much like uh, when, you know, I know it's very important for patients to obviously be participants in their healthcare, but you kind of get that phenomenon where, oh, you know, I diagnose myself on WebMD, I show up in your office and I basically tell you this, oh, I'm, you know, I, I think we can almost be dangerous to ourselves to a certain extent. Uh, and then, you know, you can find information about real estate all the time on the internet and really think you're making a good decision and end up in a horrible lease transaction, a terrible investment, it, it, something. So working with a real estate professional from the beginning, you mentioned incubator space. So you're a startup and you're not even thinking about owning property down the future. But when you enter into a lease agreement, say you outgrow your, your incubator space and you're kind of lost, you don't know where you go after that. And then how do you negotiate a lease in your favor? Um, I promise that when you go to an office building, the lease that the landlord's agent gives you is not tenant friendly. It is a landlord friendly lease. So, and then you need to always have your exit strategy and your growth strategy on, on the forefront of your decisions. Um, five, seven years down the road may seem forever away to you as a new startup, but when you are leasing space and thinking about purchasing space down the road, you need to have that whole game plan kind of fleshed out to a certain extent because what you negotiate in your lease terms in year one is gonna impact the decisions you're able to make in year five or seven, depending on how long that lease is. Commercial real estate is a very slow process. Um, I think people, this is where residential um, kind of causes some confusion with people because, you know, residential, 28 bids on a house, 
10 minutes after you put it on the market and then they close in 30 days. Um, you know, my development deals stay under contract for a full year. I have some development deals that took a year and a half to close. A purchase, give yourself six months easily, maybe more depending on any kind of build out, even just a lease in an office. You, you need to give yourself time. You got to tour, you got to negotiate. If there's tenant improvement that needs to be done, permits have to get pulled. Oh my God, pulling permits. That's an adventure in and of itself. So um, it's a very complex thing, uh, getting commercial real estate. And in residential real estate, um, you know, there's a buyer's agent, there's a seller's agent, and there's a transactional agent, which is sort of this thing in the middle. And I think a lot of people don't understand that when, when you, like, for example, when you list your house mm -hmm. and you hire a real estate agent to be the selling agent, mm -hmm. um, the commission that is awarded to the selling agent if there is a buying agent is split and paid for by the selling agent, correct? Yes. Okay. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. Like, I, I, you know, I'm looking for a house. What do I need to hire an agent for? I'm just going to have to pay them. I mean, I could figure sure. out myself. What, but actually, you're not paying them. You're, I mean, you are because it's factored into the price of the house. But the selling agent pays the buying agent. And, and the commission structures are negotiable, but sort of standard within guardrails. Is that the same thing in commercial real estate? So if I hire you to represent me uh, to negotiate a lease or maybe buy the space, who pays your commission? Do I do or does the, the tenant broker do? Historically and traditionally, it is the landlord it, um, that will pay that fee. And it's already been pre-negotiated between the owner of the property and their broker. So sometimes people do think, oh, you know, I'll get a better deal if I don't have a broker representing me. And that's really not the case at all. You're going to end up paying a lot of pass-through expenses that probably could have been negotiated in your favor. Your tenant improvement allowance might be non-existent because you didn't even know to ask for one. You might not have any free rent. Uh, so it, and then your broker should do more than just that for you. Your broker should be full service. If you need a lender, you need financing, your broker should be like, here's a list of people I've worked with that are awesome that fund medical and startup. And they should be able to give you lenders that are specific to your industry. Your broker should be the curator of a team for you. And those commissions are paid by the owner. Uh, and, and I'm always very upfront and transparent with my clients. You know, I, I tell them that, that my fees traditionally are paid this way, but if we move to a property and, and, it, and I find out that they don't pay that way, I will seek a commission from you, but you'll know ahead of time. Uh, so I'm very transparent on how fees are going to get paid and, and it should always be very clear where the fees okay. are coming from. So um, if I want to lease a space, um, what are the biggest thing, what are the biggest mistakes I'm likely to make when someone presents me with a lease agreement? Oh, well, lots of I mean, times. Other, let's assume you're not representing me, but I just, I, mean, I don't need you. I can do this myself. And I'm a doctor. I can do this. <laughs> and, right. And, uh, and so they shove a lease in front of my face and said, so now what, 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 what am I, what are the biggest mistakes? Sure. Well, um, not having an attorney review it. Cause obviously your attorneys are by the hour, like attorneys and brokers, we are totally opposite. You know, attorney is going to bill you by the minute. We work for free till the deal closes, 100% commission. So um, have an attorney review your lease. It depends on, and leases are all different. We do have a standard Colorado contract form. It's usually not used. You're generally going to have some lease that's been generated by the landlord, by their representative. It may be like 64 pages long, and it could have some clauses in there, especially with COVID. We have all these COVID addendums now in lease agreements. I mean, that's new. Those are six months old, eight months old. Those are weird. You need to make sure you understand how those are worded because that could completely, if your practice is shut down or your business is shut down, there could be some language in there that is either for you saying like, hey, maybe we're going to do some rental abatement. You just need to pay your taxes and insurance, common area maintenance, uh, and it may give you a certain number of days. So th we've got a lot of new clauses and leases now. And then there's things that are negotiable that you may not even understand what is. I mean, it is a legal contract. Those things are hard to read. 
Um, they can look very uh, docile on paper. And, you know, what's the purpose of a contract? It dictates what happens when something goes wrong. So you need to make sure you really understand that. Uh, physicians generally will lease too much space. That's a big, a big issue. And uh, startup companies do. They'll think they need a bunch of private offices. Maybe they think they need a huge waiting room. You pay per square foot. You may not need all that space. You know, we can help you lay your space out, maximize your profits right out of the gate. Right. So can you explain to us what a triple net lease is? Sure, uh, your triple net lease. So you'll see something called your base rental rate. That's what the landlord is actually charging you for the space itself. But then the landlord also has property taxes, which if you're familiar with how we tax in the state of Colorado, commercial real estate is taxed at a much, much higher rate than residential. So commercial real estate taxes are, are just unbelievable um, on a small, retail office space, uh, retail space, you may see like, I have a, I have an industrial building, 10,000 square feet. Their tax liability was um, $23,000. That is very high. Your landlord's going to pass that through to you. You're going to pay your pro rata share of the landlord's property taxes and their insurance. And then there's something called common area maintenance. So that's the three in tax, insurance, common area maintenance. And that common area maintenance is keeping the, the uh, common areas clean, the bathrooms clean. Maybe they've got some plants in the lobby. Um, any, anything that is for everyone to use, you pay those fees. So the landlord, when you see your rate might be $54 a square foot, they wanna make sure you know 30 of that is actually the rent rate and 24 of that is the property taxes, the uh, insurance and the maintenance. And like every contract or every agreement, they're all negotiable. So how much wiggle room do you have in this negotiation? Really depends on a few factors. First, it's going to depend on your owner. Sometimes your owner's financing will dictate what they can negotiate with you. The bank will actually say, you know, here's your, here's your loan, go buy your office building, but you can't have any leases below X dollar a square foot. Maybe it's a group of investors. Um, maybe it's private capital. Maybe it's a REIT. So they're going to have some matrix, matrixes that they work off of that will dictate what their bottom numbers are. Then you also have what is the owner's just personal financial position? What can be negotiated there? And then what are you offering them? Are you, you, know, are you coming in saying, oh, I want to sign a three-year lease and I want you to tear every, every um every wall down, put in new windows, carpet, your landlord's going to be like, probably not um, to took on a three-year lease. So how much term are you willing to give them? How strong of a tenant are you financially? Yes, everything is negotiable. And it's, it's uh, for 15 years, I've been a commercial real estate broker. I still have things every day that happen that I'm like, huh, never seen that before. So um, every deal is different. It depends. What do you bring into the table is what we how we negotiate. And intuitively, you would think you'd get a better deal the longer the lease. Is that correct? It generally is. Yeah, absolutely. And then you have some people that take it too extreme. Like right now, rents are in favor of the tenants. Uh, as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, 2020 emptied out a lot of commercial space. So uh, landlords aren't necessarily um, really suffering, but they definitely are not doing um, great right now. Not like, it's not a seller's market right now. It's a buyer's buyer's market for commercial real estate. And um, a, a lot of really good opportunities are out there for the tenants. So you mentioned um, in a, in a pre-conference talk that uh, developers are uh, sticking their nose under the tent of healthcare, where, where traditionally they might not have done that before. Can you kind of walk us through that? Sure. Well, obviously, developers they you know they need longevity with their businesses, and so uh, they just kind of go oftentimes where the market is, is sending them. And healthcare real estate is exploding. We have got 23.9 million square feet of healthcare real estate in the state of Colorado, 14 million square feet in Denver alone. Um, last year, we delivered 800,000 square feet of new medical office space. 
And we've got half a million of square feet under construction right now. So it is a growing industry. It's a changing industry. The way we office healthcare is changing. Um, you see office in co-working style uh, spaces now. Um, I would almost equate some of them to like food hall style spaces. So developers are like, hey, we're kind of maxed out on apartment complexes, but we need to keep building things. So where do we go now? And a lot of them are starting to look to healthcare. I met with a developer last week who traditionally does build to suits. They build like Sherwin Williams. They so a national credit tenant. They build good years. And uh, they said, hey, we're, we've moved into healthcare over the last year. Like, awesome. Well, let's talk about that. So yeah, they're just changing their models to meet the demand. Yeah, and I'm sure that people in the audience, if you um, if you live in a major metropolitan area or maybe a, a, an intermediate area, you're seeing more physician office buildings and you're seeing sort of extensions of hospitals growing their innovative networks and more and more consolidation and sort of changes and that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's, you see all these cranes all over the place. And uh, it's kind of interesting that at least in our area, um, I'm interested if anyone wants to chime in in the chat, you know, are you seeing medical slash biomedical real estate development in your area? Um, um, so, okay, so um, if I, so what do I need to know about hiring a broker? Like, why would I hire you versus somebody else? And what are those initials after your name? <laughs> the initials after my name are DMCAR. It stands for Denver Metro Commercial Association of Realtors. So just like any industry, you have got your professional organizations. And I am serve as the representative from DEMCAR to a number of legislative committees uh, in the state and national levels. I do a tremendous amount of political advocacy work for commercial real estate. Uh, you know, the every legislative session, we get tons of bills. We've got about 300 bills already that have been presented in the state of Colorado this session. That's 300 ways the government is going to dictate the way you live and work on a lot of different levels. So I'm very passionate about protecting the rights of real estate, of property ownership, and small business ownership. And that, so I do a lot of political advocacy work. And then as far as getting with a broker, get hire a broker that knows that industry. If you need medical office building, work with a broker that does medical office real estate. Don't hire your broker that sold your house. I would never sell a house. 15 years, I have been a licensed real estate agent. I've never sold a house. I never would sell a house. And if you asked me to sell your house, I would do a horrible job and maybe get both of us sued. Um, so it, there's some legal liabilities. And then I, I have dealt in many transactions with people who are represented by residential agents. And, and man, oftentimes they did their client a disservice because uh, they had no idea what they were negotiating and, and got nothing for their client. Right. So if you have, if you need a brain tumor taken out, hire a neurosurgeon. Exactly. Don't hire a foot surgeon just because they know how to use right. a scalpel. Hundred percent. Exactly. Yeah, don't hire me. Right. Yeah. Just MD <laughs> doesn't make you qualified for all the types. Right. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and are there any kind of special net? You know, are there any special initials after your name you should look out for? Or I mean, how do I know that you do? I mean, so you tell me, oh yeah, I do this all the time, but you've never represented a commercial age. How do I know that? I mean, what, is there a, a, a place I can go look it up on the internet? And who is this person and what do they do and where are their deals and all that? I mean, you can't do that in medicine. Can you do it in real estate? Um, you can. I mean, some agents will, you know, they may have a website. Oh, my past client. I mean, ask, you know, hey, tell me about the last medical deal you did, or can I talk to one of your clients? Absolutely, I can send you referrals. And then just, I mean, kind of, we can fill each other out. You know, do I even, can I even speak to medical real estate? Can I tell you what's, who, what's under construction? Do I know who any of the players are in the market? If you need a connection, can I open a door for you? I mean, it really, it's just start talking to me. If I'm fumbling over what I'm doing, oh, wrong contract. I think there should be probably some pretty clear signs, but I mean, just ask your broker, what, tell yeah. me about the medical deals you've, you've done. What, tell me about the difference between office and okay. retail. So what are the pros and cons of leasing versus buying? 
Hmm. I don't know if there are necessarily a standard set of pros and cons um, that uh, my brain is already down so deep in the, in the weeds on that question. I think it's more of a timeline for your personal business. Uh, you, like I said earlier, you need to always have your growth strategy and your exit strategy in mind. And maybe for whatever reason there you're like, oh, year one, year two, we're going to have two employees, but for whatever, something happens during year two. And by year three, you have this significant growth and then you're going to be adding equipment. So maybe a short-term lease is what you need. And then because of the nature of how the business will be funding or some kind of infrastructure you need to put into your physical location, maybe it makes more sense to purchase. I'm working with a tenant right now. They're, they're an industrial tenant, but because of the infrastructure they need in their building, we're looking to purchase. They've been leasing and, and I've said, why would you put all this money into a building? Because you're going to leave this stuff when you leave. Let's buy a building. So it's very business specific. And that's where having a competent broker is to your advantage. Um, he or she can pull that team together for you. What does your financing look like? Maybe your credit's not very great as a business right now. So let's lease something for a little bit. Let you really build up your, your company finances, get you a better interest rate and get you into a purchase in a few years. And it may go without saying, but obviously this is a team effort. So you've already mentioned the broker, you've mentioned the lawyer, and obviously there's a tax professional or an accountant that's involved Absolutely. in all of this. Right? Yeah, and is um, there a 1031 exchange? You know, I mean, oh, right, or a or a financial planning person, or an estate planning person, or any, you know, I mean, all that stuff. So you can start a lot of people to cross the T's and dot the I's. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then a um, lot of people don't even really understand their business structure. Um, you know, I definitely, I don't give advice in areas I'm not an expert, but I've had a, clients to me many times come and I'm like, oh, hey, you need to get with a business attorney because your business structure, you're not protected. You know, if, especially if it's a group of people investing, you got to have a tight operating agreement. Again, contracts, contracts are for when things go wrong, really. Yeah. And um, what new models uh, are you seeing in um, commercial real estate? You, you mentioned the uh, uh, co-working. Uh, there actually is a, uh, a person who's a doctor. I think he's a plastic surgeon in uh, Washington, D.C., who has a, uh, he started a commercial, well, a medical office building business that is actually a cross between a medical office and WeWork. So you, I mean, the, it's, it's set up like, a medical office for multiple different generally specialties. I mean, if it's a super specialty and you need real special stuff, but you know, for example, a family practice uh, environment uh, where you need certain like examining tables and just sort of generic examining stuff, maybe some equipment. And you basically lease the office space for three hours every Wednesday. Mm -hmm. um, are, are you seeing things like that around the country or is that, or what other models are you seeing? Oh, I think we're about to see a, a lot of that because, you know, it has gotten, the cost of doing business has gone up for a lot of reasons um, that I'll just skip over right now because that's a whole presentation in and of itself. And then it's very burdensome. Um, just because you're a fantastic healthcare practitioner doesn't mean you also either have the skill set or the desire to have an office manager and then the copy facilities and the break room and the, and the waiting area and all that infrastructure can be very burdensome. So yeah, uh, just because I think doctors are starting to demand different layouts, obviously patients, it's more of a patient experience. We're more consumers of our healthcare. So we're driving that as well. COVID has driven a lot of it. Obviously, suddenly you can't have a bunch of patients waiting in your waiting room. So we have to change those models. And then having all these new developers on the scene, they're bringing in new ideas and new ways to do business. So you have all these things converging. Yeah, healthcare, real estate is changing. And I think the next five to 10 years, it's gonna turn upside down. Um, you're seeing the co-working models, as you mentioned. Um, and, and so that is called co-work medical. To a, to a physician that would lease space. They deal with co-work medical. The outward facing is just, has the name of a physician group. It's called Chevy Chase 
uh, physicians, I think is what it's called. And so um, I think there's that potential stigma of like, I'm going to a doctor, a co-working doctor, like, what is this? Um, so they want it to appear as an entire unified medical practice. And it looks like it when you go in, there's a waiting room, there's a reception desk, you check in. It looks like a traditional medical office space in a medical office building. But you're only, like you said, Arlen, you're only paying for the hours you use. Generally, there's a buy-in fee. So like with a food hall, you pay, maybe you pay $15,000 when you sign the lease. And that's so that you can have use of those chairs in the common area, of any common services, the bathrooms, the, the furniture. So you didn't have to go buy that furniture. It was provided. You just paid a little bit to use it. And then um, sometimes those leases are structured as percentage rent. So however much income you make a month, you've promised X percent to the landlord, or sometimes it's just a fee. This many hours a week, you pay this much. So the models are very different, extremely different across properties. And then you have incubators. Incubators are totally different. I think with, um, I think with wet labs, you're gonna start seeing more incubator style spaces. That's very expensive to get into that. And um, 2020, just totally turned life sciences upside down. And you're seeing a lot of startup life science companies where you didn't used to see that. It would be like, do you help? We put out the innovation. Um, I'm from Alabama, University of Alabama at Birmingham. We do tons of research there. And you, you expect the new scientific discoveries to come from these large campuses where now it could be um, a startup company and, and they need space. So incubators, maybe they work more with government grants to, to get things going. So even the way you're funded as a business, you can have different opportunities depending on the style of real estate you go into. Um, we're, we've been seeing physicians move into retail space yeah. for years now. You mentioned at the very beginning when you introduced yourself that you used to be a nurse. Um, and as we all know, uh, not everybody, but a lot of doctors are grumpy and unhappy and burned out and looking for other stuff to do. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey and, and, and if a doctor or any other health professional is thinking of doing what you do, uh, can you share your experience and, and maybe some wisdom? Absolutely, yeah. And, and that is a very real thing, Arlen. 100% of the doctors, nurses, and nurse practitioners I work with have asked me, how did you get out of healthcare? Um, and that's, to me, I, that's a little sad because I mean, I left healthcare because I was unsatisfied. Uh, I, I worked as a nurse briefly and I literally said to myself, oh my gosh, if this is, I can't do this for my, like my entire adult life, I have to do this and I'm already miserable in what I'm doing. Um, I had to find an exit strategy and um, I, real estate's not necessarily for everybody. It looks quite glamorous, uh, but you know, you know, it's, it's a really hard profession. It's weird to live 100% on commission, but I think it's awesome that healthcare practitioners are asking. And, and I think sometimes when we have a very specialized education, we falsely believe that that's all we can do. And I think a lot of people turn to real estate because it's a certificate. You know, you're not committing to another four-year degree. So the barrier to entry is pretty low, honestly. I mean, let's be real. Everybody knows a real estate agent. Um, the majority of the business happens in like the top 10% of licensed brokers though. So it, it, it can be very lucrative, um, but you, you got to put the effort out. If you're really considering real estate, talk to somebody. I hear a lot of people go, oh, you know, I'm going to do residential and then move into commercial. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means because there, that's not a launching board. So talk to people who are successful in what you think you want to do and just pick their brains. Yeah. Good. Well, thanks for wonder, sharing. I almost wonder if we might see uh, healthcare practitioner satisfaction start to go up as healthcare models get turned upside down over the next few years. And I truly believe insurance has got to change eventually. Um, I know we debated a lot uh, legislatively, but uh, in philosophical. You're talking about health insurance, not real estate insurance. Correct, correct. I feel that if we have some corrections there, we maybe would see some increased job satisfaction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right, I got it. All right. Um, so are there some questions uh, from the uh, audience? Um, 
we have a relatively small group. So if any, if someone has a question um, that they want to ask, yes. then just yeah, sure. So who is this? Carol. Oh, hi, Carol. So well, why, don't you introduce, why don't you introduce yourself and ask your question? Yes, I'm Carol Wolf, Sea Change Career Services. Um, Amanda, does the healthcare industry, like certain cities or counties, give incentives to encourage folks to move into their area? Is that true in the healthcare? Are there incentives to get a brain surgeon or a pediatric doctor? You would see incentives like that maybe more tied to the actual hospital practice. So maybe you have a, a, a rural hospital. And that, you know, nobody really actually wants to live here, so we need to incentivize that physician or nurse practitioner or group of nurses to come out. So a more that would be more private funded, I would think. Um, I'm not really aware of cities or counties giving individual practitioners grants or tax breaks or, or, or you know, contributing maybe city-owned land. You do see that to the massive hospital systems, though. Absolutely, Carol. Okay. Actually, um, actually, that well, well, what Amanda said might be true. the The reality is that a lot of cities all over the world are actually paying people to move there because Denver's not uh, paying anybody no, to no, move to Denver. No, well, <laughs> but I'm talking about you know like second tier, third tier rural places. Right. Um, where they actually pay you to move there. Yeah. And I, it could be $50,000. I mean, it's not trivial for, you know, and and so I'm not sure they actually will give you a break on the building, say, so to speak, but they there are incentives. And certainly um, uh, it's kind of a trickle down effect. So if, for example, um, more and more, as we're all aware, there's been healthcare consolidation. So the bigger fish are eating the smaller fish. So when the big fish, whether it's a big integrated delivery network or whether it's private equity, scooping up a bunch of private dermatology practices and essentially aggregating them, I mean, they're basically fix and flippers. So when they do that, there's part of the plan is, for example, geographic expansion. And that may mean adding more square footage to the profile or the opposite, cutting square footage, cutting headcount, cutting overhead, because as we all know, healthcare is terribly inefficient and wasteful. Yeah. So when someone comes in and looks at an opportunity to acquire and aggregate or consolidate roll-up practices, they're looking to cut overhead. I mean, they want to make more money. They want more revenue and less cost. So part of that is the real estate equation. Now, depending, and it's all about supply and demand. So if, if you're, a, if you're for example, if you're a, uh, a rheumatologist and there aren't a whole heck of a lot of rheumatologists in the country, relatively speaking, these are joint doctors. They're, they're actually very re relatively far and few between, and there are many, many counties in the country that have no rheumatologists. Pediatric specialists or another psychologists or psychiatrists, particularly with the COVID mental health thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's hundreds of counties in the country that have no, no therapist, whether they're a social worker, a psychologist, speech language pathologist that may do some stuff, a psychiatrist, they have none. So if they're trying to attract these people, then sometimes what you're talking about will be part of the deal. And residents who are graduating medical school know that. Sure. So they're, they're wise to the fact, it's all about supply and demand. Of course, they have to be willing to move their family and live there, which is a whole other issue. Sure. But but, but the reality is there are incentives to move to these places. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you see them a lot, a lot, a lot in the private. private yeah. Industry. yeah, thanks for your question, Carol. Thank um, you. Anybody what? else have another, another question they want to ask? I'll ask one. This is Melissa Brookshire. I'm a director at a, the Denver practice lead here in Azor, for Azor Group. 
we do consulting, um, but we also do, are building out clean rooms on demand. So this is a very interesting topic for us in trying to figure out where's the right spot. And to build on Carol's question, do you see certain counties and uh, cities kind of be working with you when you're having to get special approvals for waste removals and things like that? <laughs> working with you. <laughs> Um, so historically, unfortunately, working with city and counties uh, and doing construction is is difficult. Um, they we even have certain counties, um, for example, Aurora. They they um, Denver. I don't know. I don't want to call any one city out, but they, they, they can be very difficult. So they have these master plans. And they'll say, this is an area of growth. We have identified this area. We want it to grow and change. We want to see residential density here. We've identified a need for some commercial. And they, they do studies. They'll say, hey, we've identified we need medical here or whatever. And then you're like, cool, I'm going to meet that need and I'm going to build my facility. And then it, it, the government is infinitely more dysfunctional than healthcare. And this department has one agenda and they're, they're, you know, the zoning and everything has to be within that. And then the building permits. And then even your inspector, who your inspector is, your one inspector might come out and pass you and give you your certificate of occupancy, where if it had been the other inspector on duty that day, he would have written you a sheet up with five things you had to change. So unfortunately, I don't see governments saying with open arms, like, yes, we want you here. We want to make this easy for you. Um, they really don't. They truly don't. And it's very frustrating. And again, that's why it's so important to have the, a team that knows what they're doing and can even kind of prepare you for that and, and know the city. Hey, we're going into Aurora. Historically, these things happen and it's going to take longer. So I'll give you a, a different perspective. And that is that uh, while that prop, I mean, that's true. I mean, we've all had personal experience in dealing, you know, you get your kitchen done. And that's a whole big rigmarole with the inspectors and you know all this other business. But sure. as far as specialty biomedical space, which is sure. really what we're talking about. So sure. for example, um, a bioengineering space that needs certain prototyping or high-end expensive equipment, mm -hmm. big 3D printers, um, things that you need to technically validate and verify your device, electronic equipment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and in your particular case, uh, for example, drug discovery and development startup space, flow hoods, all kinds of environmental protection things, right. clean rooms, and whether it's, it's a digital health company or a chip company, and you're, you're, you need all this special stuff that, that is expensive. So what's happening is that um, when you look at the development of ecosystems and clusters around the world, actually. And I'll give you an example. Um, what's happening is that people, that the people who are developing those so-called innovation districts understand that you're that if you're going to attract people that have the potential to basically create jobs, and that's what they're in the business of doing, then you have to give them what or offer them what they need to build their business to create those jobs. So the perfect example in Colorado, if you may or may not be aware of that, is a place like the Fitzsimmons campus or the Anschutz Medical Campus, which was conceptualized now 30 years ago, and now is a campus that includes a major health science and academic medical center, but literally across the street has a biotech park and that biotech park is specifically designed to accommodate the needs of bioengineering companies, drug discovery and development companies, you name it, with all the bells and the whistles and the gadgets and the whole deal. Now, as Amanda said, uh, those tend to be hubbed at major academic medical centers sure. because they have the resources and the grants and the space requirements and the research infrastructure. All that stuff, but and the, and, and the political connections. I mean, let's be yeah, right. and the connections and all that. But what we're seeing, at least what I'm seeing and talking to folks in my world, is this: this has become, I wouldn't say democratized, but it's being decentralized off of 
<laughs> academic medical center campuses. Absolutely. So around the world. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. So I, I recently had a conversation uh, with a representative from a country in Europe. And it is a country, and I won't mention which one, that for many, many reasons, EU politics, COVID, the Great Recession, unemployment amongst 18 to 24 year olds, social dis un unrest, political issues, you name it. What's the result? High unemployment rates, particularly amongst young people, which creates a lot of social upheaval, uh, out migration of populations because these kids want to go where the action is. And if they can't get a job, they're going to go somewhere where they can, including the United States, if they can get in. Um, and interestingly, also what we're seeing is um, the demand for mid-level reskilling. And by that, I mean people who between maybe 35 and 40 and 65. So these are people that were working in fairly traditional, in many instances, government subsidized jobs that lost their jobs because of many, many reasons. And now they have nothing to do. And oh, by the way, for example, in the United States, 30% of the US population has a college degree. 70% don't. And we're all seeing the fallout from that. And, and, and the United States does not do a good job of non-college education and training to get you a living wage job. We we've simply really, don't. We've really undervalued skilled labor in our country. Right, yeah. so, so there's this whole re-examinate and add to that, the demands of the fourth industrial revolution, which is really all about big data, analytics, storage in the cloud, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data literacy, you name it. That's what this economy is about. Mm -hmm. Well, if you worked in a Ford factory, you know, making what manufacturing or assembling whatever, you used to make a fairly good wage. Now you don't. But the economy is moving away from that because there are robots. Yep. And just like robots now, you see them on factory floors at Amazon, you see them everywhere. They've replaced people, except the people who build the robots and maintain the robots. Yep. The same thing is happening in healthcare. It's essentially happening in every industry, in every job level, including people like me surgeons, doctors, radiologists, dermat you name it. I mean, it, there's this conversation about who's going to be left standing after the music stops. So my point is mm -hmm. that to your point, I want to build a clean room office building. Where do I do that? Well, I, I think because of the things that I have just mentioned, these governments and these agencies and these developers will be much more receptive to specialized space if there's an alignment because they can't do this themselves. It's a public, private, nonprofit partnership. The entrepreneurs and the developers want to build the space and create the businesses. The governments have to change their mindset and be accommodating to this. Otherwise, they're going to be stuck in stagnating economies. Mm -hmm. And that's going to translate into what we're seeing as social unrest, including the United States. Mm -hmm. And the not-for-profits are all over STEM education, retraining, reskilling, alternative career pathways, P through 20 innovation and entrepreneurship education, STEAM education. They're all over this stuff. So there has, but there has to be an alignment of the three segments. So it has to be a public private nonprofit partnership to make sure that everybody's interest gets satisfied and this stuff actually gets done. And I'm seeing this more and more around the world and I'm seeing it more and more in the United States, particularly in second tier cities. And when I say second tier, I don't 
say that pejoratively, I mean population density generally and their interests. So 75% of bioscience drug discovery venture money goes to California, New York, and Massachusetts. Well, what about Austin? What about Indianapolis? What about Columbus? What about Orlando? What about Denver? So it's the same thing. These mid-tier cities like Detroit, which went through, you know, in, in the Great Recession, I mean, they got trashed. Now there's this big resurgence in Detroit because you could buy a house for $7,000 back in the day, not anymore. So you're seeing med tech intubators, you're seeing drug discovery incubators, you're seeing a ton of digital health and data analytics incubators. Sure. So my message to you is be patient. I think they're gonna come to you. Depending on your city, it depends on your regulation, your taxation and your zoning really. And then, like you said, Arlen, it depends on, on the stability of that city itself, where, you know, Denver is exploding. Yeah, maybe we've identified we need some medical here, but if it really doesn't fit, then, then maybe right. we work with you, maybe we don't. But then you have cities, like you mentioned, that just got decimated and the government's going, God, we need to get jobs for our people here. You know, maybe you can get something, you know, we have, we've got the ability to a rezone request. And it just really depends on your specific municipality, where they stand on how friendly they are towards those. But yeah, generally healthcare, uh, life sciences, biomedical, those are things we want in our cities. So yeah. Bob, yeah. do you, uh, Bob Thong, do you have a comment or a question? Hi, Arlen. Hi, Amanda. Thanks for the talk. Hi, Bob. Um, can, you part -time. Yeah. could you tell, your, tell the group who you are and where you are? Yeah, absolutely. I'm a part-time physician up in uh, Seattle, Washington. Um, so those cranes that you guys mentioned is uh, definitely um, ever present here. But um, one, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy and I guess uh, surprised to hear that a lot of health, um, healthcare real estate is being um, uh, developed. Man, did, what, what, is it because of the COVID? I mean, is it, um, uh, research and development that, that you're seeing that's causing this development to happen? Um, that's one question. The other question is, where, where do you see kind of healthcare real estate um, um, happening versus, uh, versus residential, uh, given that you know, each city has their own respective hospital systems and whatnot? Um, I think it's very city dependent on what's driving it, but obviously in Denver, we've had a massive influx of people moving to Denver. So there's just a sheer demand on a certain level for more, you know, we need more general practitioners because there's more people that live here. So you're seeing more space being delivered to house those services. Um, I also think that the changing dynamic and how we consume our healthcare is providing opportunity for more competition. So two factors on, on the level on, re, on why you're actually seeing more construction of healthcare space. And then it's, it's also the innovation and the changes. It's, uh, you know, a, a, a co-working style healthcare practice is something that even probably five years ago, we would have been like, what? Maybe even two years ago, we'd be like, that sounds weird. And now people are doing it. So, um, you know, when, when I go and see a healthcare practitioner, I don't love to go to a hospital to see my physician, especially if it's a well checkup. I want to go, I want to, I want to park out front. I don't want to walk very far. Um, so a lot of it is demand, you know, and I, then I want the space to be nice when I go in, um, you know, so there's just a lot that the consumer is driving that change. And then we had to go high tech in 2020. I mean, if you were a healthcare practitioner and you were not already on the cloud, had everything communicating virtually and you got shut down and you weren't ready for virtual patient visits, what did you do? You sank or swam. So uh, 2020 really made us rethink how we deliver healthcare. Um, you know, necessity is why we've changed oftentimes. And, and I think 2020 really spurred a ton of change. And then, like I said earlier, the developers, they're bringing in a lot of really cool new ideas that maybe when you just had your four main healthcare developers, they're more like, well, this is the way we've always done it. And this is how we're going to do it. Where you've got a developer that's building a totally different asset class for 15 years. And they're like, you know, they're like, hey, dude, we built a food hall and it made a lot of sense. 
We could do this with medical practices. We've got a great space here in Denver that is similar to that. So many yeah. factors. I think that I think the two main drivers. Well, there's two segments. One are integrated delivery, like in Seattle, you know, it like integrated delivery network, yeah. expanding into uh, urban and suburban neighborhoods because of the issues Amanda raised. It's not the build it and they'll come anymore. No one wants to go to, to the academic medical center and deal with all that. Yeah. They want to go to their neighborhood place, park, yep. and be able to get in. So that, and we're seeing that in Denver. So you're, you're seeing this decentralization of service for, of service. So they have to build these buildings and go where the patients are. Mm -hmm. But that's being driven mostly by large integrated delivery networks who are gobbling up market share in a given region. The other are the independent physicians who are not, I mean, they're, they're, they have their own private practice or they work for a group and um, they are facing the same thing because there's a lot of competition, but they also are looking for alternatives to what we alluded to before. They, they don't want to pay for you know, the old commercial, why pay for minutes you don't use? Yeah. It's particularly if you're in a specialty where most of the revenue is generated in the operating room and you have to see the patients in the clinic to get the patient to the operating room. But the times are different. So you don't want to pay for a lot of space with like a neurosurgeon. I mean, they spend most of their time in the operating room because of the nature of what they do. But in the meantime, they're paying for the office they're not using. And there's all kinds of iterations of that among specialties, as you know. So yep. I think, so to summarize, I think increasing consolidation, increasing uh, geographic expansion, meeting the needs of the patients where they are, are, is driving integrated delivery network real estate development throughout the region. From the private side, the factors that I just mentioned, alternative practice arrangements, mini practices, I wanna do this the way I wanna do it. I don't wanna pay for a big space if I don't have to. I don't want to pay for people that I don't need. It's basically revenue versus cost. Physician, independent, phys well, everybody, physician revenues are dropping and will drop further. So people are worried about how, how much, now nobody's going to shed a tear for a doctor. I'm not implying that. <laughs> what I'm saying is though, that the, the expectation is I'm going to make less money than Arlen did because I did this a million years ago and that's just the way it was. Mm -hmm. So things are changing. So I, I think independent practitioners, residents, fellows that are coming out of practice, they're $209,000 in debt on average. So they're thinking, wait a minute, I need to make a buck. I need to cut my cost. How do I get some space to do this that accommodates my needs? So I, I think those are the factors that are driving this. So, so many different, yeah, so many different influences. I, yeah, that's a good question, so. Yeah, healthcare is so exciting. Y'all yeah, right. are seeing so many changes. <laughs> well, we're out of time. I yeah. appreciate, Amanda, all your uh, insights and the uh, questions from the audience. I hope uh, you found this valuable and that you'll continue to tune in for these uh, SOAP webinars. If you're interested, go to www.soapnet.org events. And you'll see, uh, actually, we're producing lots and lots of them. Uh, and hopefully, they will uh, answer some questions that you're having. So uh, thanks a lot. And uh, have a good week. Yeah, y'all find me on LinkedIn. Ask me questions. I love to talk about this. All right. Thanks, <laughs> okay. Bye. Have a good yeah. day.